Hello, I'm John from Bathwick Electrical Design or BEDL, a UK company spun out from Bath University by Professor Dave Roger and Dr Hong Cheng Lai. We've collaborated with Josh and Radnia from the Electric Power Engineering Centre, University of Canterbury, New Zealand. Both the UK and New Zealand are islands with considerable wave energy potential. There have been many, many types of wave energy converter proposed and ways to categorise them. Most of them have in common a two-stage process where the wave motion is first converted to some form of intermediate motion, for example an oscillating air column or a float bobbing up and down. And then a PTO or power takeoff is used to convert that intermediate motion to electricity. So here we're going to introduce a novel PTO which uses a magnetic screw thread and could be applied to any wave energy converter that has an intermediate motion um, which is a mechanical reciprocating um, movement. For the purpose of this study we use possibly the simplest form of wave energy converter which is a buoy and a reaction plate. The buoy follows the local water surface height and the reaction plate stays stationary and uh, energy is extracted by the relative motion of these two parts. Some wave energy converters have built-in energy storage in hydraulic systems for example they can have an accumulator and we can have flywheels on our uh, form of PTO but in this case we looked at what happened if there was no energy storage and we just directly converted the energy uh, to electricity and what impact that might have on the local electricity grid on an island. So to look at the PTO in more detail it uses a screw thread to convert slow linear motion to fast rotary motion uh, at the same time that changes a high force to a low torque and that's an advantage because a low torque means a compact generator which can be realized with quite a conventional permanent magnet arrangement and the conversion is achieved in a single stage unlike for example a rack and pinion system that would typically need a multi-stage gearbox we acknowledge the funding support we've had from Wave Energy Scotland to develop this. Here we see a photograph of a prototype that we've built which is currently being tested in the water off Scotland. The section diagram here shows the same thing. We have a threaded rod that passes down through a rotor. This rotor is caused to spin by the thread and around the rotor we have a stator to generate electricity. This system could be realized in a purely mechanical way, for example using a ball screw, but here we've done it with magnetic threads. This provides low friction and therefore low wear, and more uniquely it allows the device to slip if it's overloaded without any damage. So here we have the threaded rod. To get a maximum force we would put permanent magnets both on the rod and the rotor but the rod is very long so economically it's better to make the rod a simple iron arrangement and just have the permanent magnets inside the rotor. This prototype we built has a 600 millimeter diameter and has a peak force capability of 3 tons or 30 kilonewtons. So to look at how it's incorporated into the wave energy converter we start with the reaction plate um, pulling or anchoring the uh, cable and mooring line which passes up and uh, transfers force up through sliders uh, into a dry chamber and these sliders are connected to hold the stator stationary the stator is also connected to the rams of gas springs which are there to support the 
force or the steady state force from the weight of the mooring system and the reaction plate uh, and they're tuned so that at rest the stator is held halfway um, within, the, within the stroke available. We see the iron rod passing down through the rotor and this has hardened tracks in it which are used to support it as it passes through the magnetic rotor. Also the torque from the screw thread action is reacted locally by the tracks so it isn't transferred down the length of these rams and sliders. We've modelled the boy in a uh, MATLAB Simulink's Simscape package to make a time domain model. The first thing that we need to know in this model is which parts move and which parts don't. So the parts in red, which are connected to the reaction plate, don't move. They're simply represented by a mechanical earth. All the green parts bob up and down as the waves go past, so that's a mass which must be represented because it will be accelerated. And of course gravity is acting on that mass, so we have the weight. Connecting the moving mass to the static mass is the gas strut system or gas spring system and that is represented by the brown box uh, so we have a spring constant and the end stops represented there. So the water surface height uh, reads from a file and acts upon the buoy which is in here in yellow. This represents the buoyancy of the yellow float. Having vertical sides it's a linear system with submersion um, but it's bounded by coming right out of the water or being completely submerged. This block also takes into account viscous drag of the buoy moving through the water. The purple section is the power takeoff so we have a block to represent the magnetic coupling between the threaded rod and the magnets inside the rotor and the <coughs> action of the thread to convert rotary to linear motion, the generator torque and the moment of inertia of the rotor. The green block is the power converter and its control the generator torque is controlled to be proportional to the speed and the acceleration is derived and used for some inertia compensation. The magnetic block I talked about has a sinusoidal characteristic. Um, from the prototype for the purpose of this study we've now scaled up the design to have a peak capability of a 173 kilonewtons. Uh, the float has been deliberately designed so it would be submerged in severe weather um, to limit the amount of force that it places on the rest of the system. As I mentioned the, um, the torque is proportional to velocity. This is a constant damping coefficient the magnetic coupling is quite springy and there are inertias associated with that which cause resonances and having a linear uh, damping system quickly suppresses those resonances. In the paper we derive th these equations 2 and 3 here using a simple sinusoidal analysis. This gives us a first guess at what this torque um, velocity constant should be. Combining these equations we see that the average power we can get out is dependent on the maximum force that the magnetic thread can achieve. Essentially minus a term with the linear inertia that has to be accelerated in it. And um, it's quite telling that uh, only 7 kilogram meters squared of rotary inertia 
is equivalent to 67.5 tons of linear inertia. So it's clear that we want to minimize the inertia term to maximize the power. And this can be done to some extent with a mechanical design and it can also be done to some extent using inertia compensation control which I mentioned. Um, the gear ratio is a balance. If we reduce the gear ratio it reduces the inertia. On the other hand the torque goes up and that makes the um, size of the rotary generator much larger so that has to be a balance. So after the sinusoidal analysis we run the model with a non-sinusoidal input and do the final tuning of the torque velocity relationship. Um, and it's interesting to see from these graphs that um, the power out which is averages 25 kilowatts is very very sm much smaller than the actual peak power which hits 200 kilowatts. So I'll hand over now to Josh to finish the presentation. Thank you John. So for the rest of this presentation I would like to take the result from the previous slide where we could see that the peak power output of a buoy is significantly larger than the average. We will call this variability and we will look for ways to try and minimize it. The first thought we could have is to maybe use energy storage. However, we should first consider aggregation where multiple buoys are grouped into wave farms. Then hopefully the uncorrelated power outputs from each buoy will smooth out the total. To do this, we need to take into consideration spatial and temporal correlations in ocean wave height at such short distances. Then the, the results from this analysis will give us a rule to minimize variability. To simulate the power output of a single wave farm, we need to create a time series of wave height over a two-dimensional spatial field. To do this, we can create a stochastic model. The first part is the Brett-Schneider spectrum that gives us the strength of the wave and their period. Then the directional spectrum tells us which way the waves are coming. And then finally, we have the dispersion relationship that gives us the relationship between the wave length and wave period. These three things combine to give us a three-dimensional wave power spectral density. To implement the stochastic model, we evaluate wave height at discrete time and spatial points. Firstly, create a wave field at the initial time by Gaussian white noise and scale it by the spectral density we developed from the previous slide. We can then take the inverse Fourier transform from this to give us the wave height at time zero. To progress time further, consider the wave number of each component wave and progress the phase of each of those components by the wave period determined by the dispersion relationship. The results is a video shown here on this slide. The strength of these waves is a significant wave height of 1.9 meters and a mean wave period of 6.5 seconds. The next step is to create the wave farm. We assign positions to each buoy and from those positions interpolate the wave height from the wave field. This will give us a time series for each location. We've created a wave farm by, taking, by making it a square array where we have a constant separation distance between each buoy of distance d. This value is varied in the next couple of slides to see what impact it has on variability and we simulate the power output by the model previously given by John. After using John's SimScape model, we have a power time series for a single buoy here on the left, and a power time series for our 100 buoy wave farm here on the right. We have scaled the right hand side by 0.01 to compare the variability on a per buoy basis. As you can see, the variability of one single buoy is significantly larger than that of the wave farm. 
Obviously, the uncorrelated nature of the power outputs of each individual boy tend to cancel out the peaks and troughs as more boys are added together. To consider the impact of spacing on the variability of the whole wave farm, I have shown here a plot of this variability, which is shown here on the white axis by the standard deviation in power output, and looked at how it changes as the number of boys in a wave farm increases. So if the power output of each individual boy is effectively uncorrelated, then the variability should increase according to that black line shown in this plot, a square root relationship. You can see this happens for separation distances of 66.4 meters, which is the dominant wavelength in these conditions. And then as we bring those boys closer together to 16.6 meters, you can see that the variability increases quite substantially. It increases above that black line. So at separation distances of 16.6 meters, there is a certain amount of correlation between boys. At separation distances of three quarters of the dominant wavelength, this is considered the minimum separation distance for minimizing variability. The impact of variability is now assessed in terms of the power system. To particularly, we are going to look at how frequency keeping requirement would change in New Zealand. Frequency keeping is a reserve to keep frequency at 50 Hz due to normal variations in demand and generation. The current requirement for frequency keeping is 30 MW and this covers the variability of 18.8 .8 MW overall. That is a coverage of 1.6 standard deviations. If we incorporate a wave farm of 100 boys, 10 times the nominal power output of the one previously presented in this paper, then the average power output of that wind wave farm would be 20 MW and a variability of 2.9 MW. If we add this to the variability that we currently have of 18.8, we get a total of 19. Now variabilities do not add directly, they add by the square root of sum of squares. So we can see that one wave farm isn't going to have much of an impact. But what if we have 100 such wave farms? It was calculated that the total requirement would increase to 55 megawatts. Historically, this is an exceptional our frequency keeping requirements in the past have exceeded 70 and higher. Also, if we note that how quickly these variations oscillate, that they are very fast and most of these variations won't even merit a response from frequency keeping and be damped by the power system's inertia. In conclusion, we have presented a novel PTO that has a magnetic screw design which minimizes frictional losses and allows for slipping when the conditions are rough. After doing simulations, modeling wave fields and power outputs, we have found if a wave farm is separated by a distance of three quarters of the dominant wavelength between boys, then this is sufficient to minimize variability of the whole wave farm. Looking at its impacts, if 2,000 megawatts of wave energy were installed in New Zealand, the variability of, of the power output would not be a significant burden. And to finally finish off this presentation, I would like to present a photo of a, of a boy in action in Scotland. Thank you.